Hello, my name is Michael, and you're listening to Pharma CR. For this episode, we are going to do a brainstorm session. The idea behind this type of episode is to share ideas or advice as a pharmacy community. Today, we are going to share our favorite OTC tips and tricks. In part two of our series, you will have an in-depth discussion with Dr. Ralph Chu on OTC Eye Care. I have Sarkis Trebrazian, a Waterloo pharmacy student, helping me with this episode. Hi everyone, my name is Sarkis and I'm currently doing my second co-op placement here at Vena Pharmacy in Toronto, Canada. In the future, we may have brainstorm sessions on other topics such as asthma, diabetes, or even practice issues. The intended audience of this program is healthcare professionals. Please contact your healthcare provider for specific advice. This, this is a Pharma, is a Pharma CR, CR brainstorm, Pharma session. CR Pharma brainstorm, CR session. CR brainstorm session. Let's start off with a tip about one of the most important OTC products we sell. Aspirin 81 milligrams to prevent stroke and heart attack. Aspirin is the only non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, or NSAID, indicated as antiplatelet therapy. It is easily one of the most popular OTC products sold at any pharmacy, with an estimated 4 million Canadians taking it daily. It is estimated that 25% of Canadians are also prescribed NSAIDs for short-term use. This does not take into account the NSAIDs sold over-the-counter at pharmacies. Pharmacists may recommend NSAIDs to treat a variety of symptoms, including headache, arthritis, inflammation, pain, and fever. It is very common for patients to have a simultaneous need for both these products. So how do we manage their concurrent use? First, let's talk about how aspirin works as an antiplatelet and how NSAIDs can interfere with this process. Aspirin inhibits both COX-1 and COX-2 enzyme. COX-1 is required to produce thromboxane A2, which is a promoter of platelet aggregation. COX-2, on the other hand, produces the prostaglandins involved in pain and fever. What makes aspirin so effective is that it will bind irreversibly to COX-1. Therefore, its effect will last for the entire lifetime of that platelet, which is approximately 10 days. Your body will also produce new platelets at approximately 10% per day. Therefore, aspirin will need to be taken daily to ensure its efficacy. Other NSAIDs may still bind and inhibit COX-1 enzyme. However, this interaction occurs at a different site within the same area. It is important to note that this binding is in fact reversible. This means that its antiplatelet effect occurs only for a short period of time after administration. Therefore, other NSAIDs do not provide effective antiplatelet therapy and on the other hand will actually compete with aspirin binding. The effect of this competition is greatly amplified because of aspirin's very short half-life. Aspirin has a half-life of approximately 20 minutes. If there's another NSAID competing for that binding site, the amount of aspirin that effectively binds is tremendously reduced since it's eliminated so quickly. A study published in the Journal of Clinical Pharmacology in 2008 attempted to measure the significance of this interaction. Subjects who were taking daily doses of ibuprofen or naproxen with aspirin were followed over a 27-month period. In all 18 patients that returned for follow-up, the researchers found that platelet function was similar to that of patients not taking any aspirin at all. The inappropriate co-administration of other NSAIDs completely nullified aspirin's effect in this study. When the ibuprofen or naproxen was stopped, the expected antiplatelet effect was once again found. So what are some solutions that we can use to manage the serious interaction? Well, the simplest answer is to avoid other NSAIDs altogether and to use acetaminophen. For many patients, however, acetaminophen may not be an acceptable alternative either due to efficacy or the need for an anti-inflammatory effect. Another option is to dose these NSAIDs apart. Because of aspirin's short half-life, ibuprofen can be dosed as soon as half an hour later. This is assuming an immediate release aspirin formulation. 
If the product is coated, it may be best to wait two hours before giving another NSAID. Aspirin also needs to be dosed eight hours after the previous ibuprofen dose to be effective. For very short term use, Separating the dosing may be an appropriate solution for certain patients. Managing the complex dosing requirements may be too challenging for others. For these patients, or for patients using NSAIDs more routinely, our tip would be to switch them from ibuprofen to aspirin. This means that we are recommending these patients use aspirin for both PRN use and for its antiplatelet effect. There is no concern with a reduced antiplatelet effect if patients are taking aspirin PRN on top of their 81 milligrams. As long as we are aware that aspirin has a maximum daily adult dose of 4,000 milligrams, using additional aspirin PRN can be a safer and simpler option for a lot of patients. In addition, aspirin does not have the cardiovascular risk associated with other NSAIDs. There's one more option that you can recommend for these patients as a last resort. Certain prescription NSAIDs, such as diclofenac or meloxicam, have shown to not interfere with aspirin's antiplatelet effect. However, meloxicam would be the better option of the two because of diclofenac's higher cardiovascular risk. Naproxen, as you probably know, has a low cardiovascular risk compared to other NSAIDs, but some studies have shown it interfering with aspirin's antiplatelet effect. Ideally, we want to avoid long-term NSAID use in these patients, not only for the GI bleed risk, but because any non-aspirin NSAID will carry some cardiovascular risk. In conclusion, don't forget to consider aspirin as a PRN NSAID alternative. It will not interfere with your patient's low-dose ASA therapy, and it does not carry the same cardiovascular risk as other NSAIDs. Now let's talk about one of the most common over-the-counter supplements, calcium. Calcium carbonate is the most pharmacist-recommended calcium supplement because it contains the most amount of elemental calcium at 41%. Calcium carbonate usually contains at least 500 mg per pill. Calcium citrate or magnesium may contain 250 to 350 mg per pill. So is there a place in therapy for other calcium supplements? Well, one reason is that certain calcium supplements can be taken on an empty stomach. Calcium carbonate is an insoluble salt, whereas calcium citrate is a soluble salt. Insoluble calcium salts need a lower pH to help release ionized calcium from the complex. This means that in order to absorb calcium carbonate, it must react with hydrochloric acid in the proximal small intestine to form soluble calcium chloride. The reason we take calcium carbonate with food is because gastric acid production is highest during meals. Calcium citrate, on the other hand, can be taken with or without food. This is a useful option to prevent certain calcium drug interactions such as with iron, tetracyclines, or fluoroquinolones. Another reason you would use other calcium supplements is to reduce side effects. Calcium carbonate is associated with more GI effects such as gas and constipation. Calcium citrate is better tolerated, most likely due to the fact that there is less elemental calcium per pill. Another option could be to switch the patient to a calcium supplement containing magnesium. Magnesium is a natural laxative and it counterbalances the constipating effects of calcium. One issue that is becoming better known is the effect of PPIs on bone health. So would calcium citrate be a better option for patients using PPIs? The most widely assumed mechanism is that PPI use results in less gastric acid secretion, resulting in a reduced intestinal absorption of calcium. Short-term studies have provided conflicting results. In some studies, PPIs or H2Rs have been shown to decrease calcium absorption, with omeprazole causing a 41% decrease in one study, whereas in other studies, they did not observe decreased calcium absorption. The effect of long-term PPIs on bone health is also somewhat inconsistent in studies. Five out of seven studies since 2006 have associated long-term PPI usage with an increased occurrence of bone factors. So until there's a definitive answer for the mechanism of this effect, calcium citrate might be an option to consider. However, investigating whether the PPI can be discontinued is probably the better option. 
Another reason we may want to use calcium citrate is in patients that have a history of kidney stones. You may have had a patient come into your pharmacy wanting to stop their calcium supplement because they recently experienced a kidney stone. Our tip is to recommend switching them over to calcium citrate. Studies show calcium citrate helps to increase urinary citrate excretion, which inhibits the formation and growth of calcium crystals. Continue to reinforce prevention strategies such as reducing dietary oxalate, increasing fluid intake, and increasing dietary calcium. However, adding or switching to calcium citrate is a great option to help with both osteoporosis and preventing calcium oxalate stones. In conclusion, based on the current literature, calcium carbonate is still an appropriate calcium supplement for patients on long-term PPIs. But consider calcium magnesium or citrate for patients with GI side effects, and consider calcium citrate if we require calcium dosing in between meals and for patients with a history of calcium oxalate kidney stones. Before we go into our last tip of the episode, let's take a break by talking about the podcast for a little bit. We've had listeners asking about how they could be involved with the podcast. We are happy to announce that we are now a University of Toronto Appy non-direct patient care rotation. Please consider selecting us as a rotation if you are interested in working on your own podcast episode. Another way to get involved is by coming to one of our pharmacy meetups that we will be hosting in Toronto. These are monthly events where you can network, discuss pharmacy, complete continuing education courses together, and of course, help us produce future Pharmacy R podcast episodes. We will announce location and dates later. Also, please help us spread the word on our podcast. Tell all your pharmacy friends and work colleagues about the show. We have big plans for the podcast and want to tackle all of the most important pharmacy issues. The more listeners we have, the better our chances of convincing decision makers of coming on our show. As the current opioid crisis continues to escalate, Health Canada has recently announced they are considering changing Tylenol-1s and other low-dose codeine combination products to prescription only. We're working on a separate episode where we'll be taking an in-depth view on the scheduling of these products, which will be released very soon. Health Canada is accepting comments on the issue until November 8th, but let's talk about something you can do right now to help prevent misuse of these products. In my opinion, there are four main barriers that make it difficult for pharmacists to effectively prevent misuse of these products. Firstly, there is no way to monitor patient use. We have no way of knowing if a patient has purchased these products from another pharmacy. Secondly, the labeling on these products makes no mention of its addictive potential. This contradicts the counseling that pharmacists try to provide and downplays the seriousness of addiction with these products. We have a bottle of generic Tylenol 1s right here. On the outside of the bottle, there is no mention of the recommended dosage. You actually have to peel back the label to see this information. Although it does say do not exceed 12 caplets in 24 hours, this text is not bolded or highlighted in any way and is buried in the middle of a paragraph. The inner label mentions that overdose may result in severe or possibly fatal liver damage. However, there is absolutely no mention of potential dependency or addiction. Thirdly, the pharmacy is a very difficult environment to have a serious discussion about pain and addiction. These are very private issues. In the pharmacy, there are phones going off, you have other patients waiting for their prescriptions, uh, sometimes in the immediate area. It is almost impossible to make a real connection, especially with someone you just met, in such a busy and public area. To get someone to address their addiction requires long-term support and a real relationship with their healthcare professional. Even when we ask all the right questions in the pharmacy, there are so many interruptions and distractions that make it difficult for patients to open up. Fourthly, is that pharmacists do not have the proper support to address serious addiction. We do not receive addiction counseling training as part of our education, and these patients deserve to have this discussion with someone with the proper training or someone they can relate to, oftentimes someone who has survived opioid addiction themselves. 
We also do not have the support to administer urine screening to check for other substances. With all of these barriers, pharmacists are at a huge disadvantage in being able to provide meaningful interventions. Another factor to consider is that if the pharmacist refuses to sell a patient Tylenol-1, the patient may purchase illicit alternatives which carry a greater opioid overdose risk and can worsen their dependency. Here at Vena Pharmacy, we actually make our own generic Tylenol-1 auxiliary labels to help with some of these issues. It's very easy to do yourself. All we do is print our message out on regular paper, cut it into small strips, and attach it on the bottles. The message states, Tylenol-1s can be addictive and overuse can cause serious liver damage. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to speak with a pharmacist or you can call the Drug and Alcohol Helpline at 1-800-565-8603. This addresses the labeling deficiency. It also gives the patient access to someone who is qualified to help them and allows them to have that conversation on their own terms in a private setting. Depending on your practice site, you may also choose to attach your own auxiliary labels to other Schedule II products, such as combination codeine cough syrups or other codeine-containing products. You may also choose to have them on certain pack sizes only. Another area you can apply the strategy is with naloxone kits. Whether you are ordering the complete naloxone kit or preparing your own, please include a visual aid handout with your kits. The naloxone kits that we receive at our pharmacy does not include any patient instructions. Even if your naloxone counseling is perfect, trained individuals may forget important details in the urgent moments of an overdose. The person who receives the kit and the appropriate training may not be the one who ends up administering it. This is why it is very important to include a visual guide inside each kit. We will provide the link to the handouts that we use in the comment section. So we recommend you do this as soon as possible because you never know if you will make a difference in someone's life. Do your part in preventing opioid misuse with this little tip. So that's it for part one of our OTC brainstorm session. Please join us next week for part two, where we will be discussing OTC eye care with Dr. Ralph Chu.